This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Kim Henning. Pastor Coley and I serve the community known as Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. Grace Congregational Church is the oldest congregation in Two Rivers. Since 1851, this community has gathered people of faith together during the Civil War, during World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, and now the battles that are taking place in the Middle East. Through all those years, this church has called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the 1850s, the cholera epidemic swept through portions of the United States. In the 1920s, we experienced the Spanish flu. In the 1980s, we had the AIDS epidemic. And today, we are resisting the corona uh, virus. Through all those years, this church and others have called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gathering for this service of worship is uh, on the back side of our local hospital. You are aware of the challenges that our healthcare workers have endured. When we are at our sickest, we come here. When we cannot mend ourselves at home, we come to places like this where doctors and nurses and other trained medical personnel take care of us. We do not take our hospitals for granted. The idea of coming here for this worship service uh, came due in part to the coronavirus, but it's also due to the scripture that you'll be hearing later. Peter and John are going to go to the temple to pray. They meet there a person who has, had, who has been lame since birth they lay their hands upon him in the name of Jesus Christ, and he is healed. This is the very first healing that takes place in the book of Acts. As we gather for worship, we are mindful of our members, doctors, nurses, and others, who serve places like this. As we gather for worship, we are mindful of our hospitalized. We are mindful of Tao Lynn Huffman, who has been released from the care of this hospital. We are mindful of Al Nelson, who, as of Thursday today, is still a, a patient here, and Marilyn Dunlap, who is a patient at Aurora Baycare. Let us prepare ourselves for the worship of God.
grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one risen from the dead. Amen. Come, beloved, and join me as we enter into the very presence of God. Come, and remember the God who led Abraham and Sarah and their offspring to the land of Canaan. Come, and remember with me the God who visited Moses, who led the Hebrews out of captivity. Come, and remember with me the God who spoke to the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, during the Babylonian captivity. Come and remember with me our God who has come to us in Jesus Christ. According to Matthew, Jesus proclaimed good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Come, beloved, and let us worship God. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, we honor you and we bow before you. Years ago and even today, your followers call upon your name and we have received something more powerful and more valuable than riches. We have been given healing. We have been given love. We have been given hope. We have been given courage to live our lives faithful to you. Bring healing to our world, we pray, and strengthen us in our resolve to be faithful to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
something a little different that we'd like to offer you this morning during this service of worship. We are aware of the special calling God has given each of us as we seek to live our lives here on earth. Each of us has a special gift from God. Each of us has a talent. Each of us has a calling that is unique. In a special sort of way, we are mindful of health care workers during this particular season of life. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Bill Hampton. Receive him, receive his gift as part of our worship of God. My name is Bill Hampton. I'm an emergency physician at Holy Family Memorial. I offer this prayer on behalf of many of us inside and outside the church who serve as healthcare workers. Please pray with me. Christ, our healer, there is no end to the malady, sickness, injury, and disease in this broken world. Therefore, give me grace, O God, that I might be generous with my kindness, and that in this caretaking vocation, my hands might become an extension of your hands, and my service a conduit for your mercy. It is often not an easy place to be, so near to suffering, to injury, to pain, to emergency and fear and confusion, and sometimes even to dying and death and grief. But I believe it is exactly the sort of place you would be, O Lord, amidst those who hurt. So, let my practice of medicine be centered in an understanding of your heart. Let me practice medicine because you are a healing God who feels compassion and extends mercy. Let me practice medicine because you are near to those who are in need, to those who face grief and loss. Let my presence lend a human face to your compassion. Give me grace to be an attentive and responsive to the hearts of human beings made in your image. Let me extend kindness and mercy even to those who are angry, frightened, bitter, or in pain. Let me especially love them, for they suffer as we all suffer from physical ailments and from a certain distance from your grace and mercy. Apart from your grace, I have no grace to give. So give me your grace in greater measure, O Lord. Let me never be so consumed by my vocation that those closest to me suffer negligence. I would be a living... I would be a living witness of your love, expressed in the practical care of people. I would be your disciple in this place, at this time, among these people. So be near, Lord Christ. Give me grace this day and all days, that I might serve you well by loving and serving others. Amen.
Hello, my name is Hannah Boutnick. And I'm Addison. We are about to read Psalm 63, a prayer of comfort. You'll notice that this psalm, in this psalm, the psalmist is well grounded in the presence of God. The psalmist knows that the good life is rooted in faith. The right at the, right at the beginning, the psalmist reminds us all that we are thirsty for God's presence in our lives. Please pray with us. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up with the hands and call your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, my mouth will pray with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and I will shadow of your wings and I will sing for your joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over the power of the sword, they shall be pray for the jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God, and all who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. I'm Brian Wingarden. I'm going to be reading Mark 6, 53 through 56. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Did you say good morning? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for church today. Our story today is about two of Jesus's followers and friends, Peter and John, and they are on their way to the temple. They're on their way to their church to pray. And as they're walking, they pass by a man who it says is lame. His legs don't work. Maybe he uh, got hurt or maybe he's disabled uh, since birth. We don't know exactly, but he is sitting there along the side because he can't get himself around. And as Peter and John walk by, they notice him, they see him, they look at him, and they say to him, look at us. And that made me think, Lincoln, about times that you aren't always listening. What do, Lincoln, what do I say to you when you're not listening? Look at me. Yeah, I say, you're not listening. And then I say, look at me, right? Look at me right now. Look at me. If you're not listening, I say, look at me. And you listen better when you're looking at me, don't you? If you're looking at me, you listen better. And it's kind of like that in our story today. Peter and John, they say, look at us. And it says the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something. And Peter says, I have no silver or gold. I don't have money for you, but what I have... I will give you. And he gives him a blessing in the name of Jesus, and the man stands up and walks. But there's something important that happens in that moment when they look at each other. They're able to listen better because they can see each other. They can understand each other. They exchange something important in that looking and listening. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Oh, the Lord is good to me. And so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. The Lord is good to me. Amen, 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 amen.
I'm reading to you from the book of Acts, chapter 3. Listen for God's word. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. These are words of Holy Scripture. The church believes they can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God who comes to us decisively in Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Luke describes him ever so simply. He was a man lame from birth. We don't know if he had any brothers or sisters. We don't know his name or the whereabouts of his mother or father. We don't know much of anything about this man who was lying there outside the temple of, in Jerusalem. He was a man lame from birth. Lame. He was probably unable to dress himself in the morning. Lame. He probably needed help whenever he needed to go to the bathroom. He was lame. If he was hungry, he probably had to call out for food. If he was thirsty, he probably had to call out for water. Lame. As you heard, I, I used the word probably several times. What we do know for sure is that this man was unemployable. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple so he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. He was a beggar. H have you ever had to beg for your survival? People. Uh, they're not even identified as friends. People, the text said, people laid him at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. G can you spare a coin? I I'm hungry. Hey, just a little, please. Please, just a little. The people entering and leaving the temple probably learned the art of avoiding eye contact. He probably cried out louder, Sir, sir, you in the red sweater, you have spotted sandals. You, you, could you please spare a coin? Now it was the ninth hour, is what the older versions of the Bible would say. It was three o'clock, according to the version you heard just a few moments ago. Peter and John were about to enter the temple. It was the hour of prayer. And sure enough, the beggar asked them for alms. This was not unreasonable. Peter and John were people of faith. Our faith speaks about compassion. Our faith speaks about generosity. Our faith speaks about our regard for the vulnerable of this world. It's kind of our responsibility. It is right there in the book of Leviticus. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the edges of the field or gather the gleanings of the harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes. And then the text says, thus says the Lord. Alms, he cried to Peter and John, who were about to pray. Then Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. 
But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And Peter took him by the right hand and uh, raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. What you and I just heard is the first recorded healing in the early church. Imagine that. We are here in the book of Acts. Jesus in Acts chapter 1 has ascended into heaven. And now in Acts chapter 2 and going forward, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and the Apostle Paul uh, give leadership to the gathering, to the koinonia, to the church. What does it mean to be the church? Well, they would preach, they would teach, they would observe the sacraments, they would evangelize, they would tell others about Jesus Christ, and they would reach out to the Gentiles. But here in Acts 3, something as old and as beautiful as you can imagine, a healing, enters into the very work of the early church. I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he did. It is important that we talk about the healing ministry entrusted to the church. The church, of course, is about social justice. The church is about raising up our prayers to God. And the church is about pastoral care, caring for the least of God's children. But let us not forget, a key component of this or any Christian ministry is healing. Think about that beloved Psalm, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and let all that is within me bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. There it is, there it is. Who heals all your diseases. We know, do we not, the name Miriam? Miriam, some 1,200 years before Christ, was the sister and in some ways a partner with Moses in leadership. It is Miriam in Exodus 15 who records a word of God given to her. I am the Lord who heals you. God is one to believe in, to be sure. But it is also God who heals. Frederick Gazer is a retired professor who for years taught at Luther Seminary in the Twin Cities. In the opening of one of his books, he writes about a sabbatical that he took in South Africa. Gazer worked with the church in South Africa. On uh, one occasion, he writes about a time when it was bitterly cold and the church had, had, had scheduled an outdoor revival service. And Gazer, Gazer was asked to participate. The first thing that Gazer writes about is that the number of people, the number of people who showed up in the bitter cold of winter outdoors for a revival service. The faith, the faith just meant that much. Gazer was astounded. As part of that revival, a laying of, on of hands was offered to the worshipers and Gazer was asked to lead one of the lines going forward. At first, just a few came, but then people came forward with their illnesses and their cancers and their diseases and their broken hearts and their depressions and all those things that just nearly destroy us. Gazer said that they and he prayed for their minds, they prayed for their bodies, they prayed for their souls as they came forward. And he said there was such joy. At the end, he said, we, we did no statistical analysis of the healings that day. But the striking part, according to Gazer, was that God was honored and God was trusted with the troubled human beings in that setting. And it was such a powerful experience. I wish 
for a scripture like Acts chapter 3, and that we could be physically present one with another. It would be beautiful, would it not, to pray for the diseases and illnesses common to our humanity. It would be beautiful, would it not, to, to ask, to, 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 to scan the congregation and to ask, oh, what is troubling you, what is hurting you at this very moment? It would be beautiful, would it not be, to pray for each other, eye to eye, heart to heart, hand to hand, as we discern those broken shags of life that make this existence on earth so difficult. Acts chapter 3 is a powerful scripture that is before us this morning. During this season of life that we are battling the coronavirus. But never is the church without power. The power of prayer spoken in Jesus name. Never is the church without a ministry at a time like this. In the face of a virus that is so mysterious and so powerful and so threatening. This is the season of Easter when the church announces the power that has been given us. A power over death, a power capable of healing, a power that can destroy hatred and reconciles human beings. Some uh, 30 years ago, unknowingly, I just simply clipped an article out of a magazine, I think it was Newsweek, and then I slipped it into one of the folders that I have at church. I didn't know the person who was being referenced in the article, but I certainly do recognize the name now. The article some 30 years ago was about Dr. Ben Carson, who just a few years ago was a candidate for the presidency. In the article I read and clipped and saved, the author talked about the angry and mean-spirited childhood that Carson practiced. He grew up hearing the N-word frequently. He grew up being belittled by his classmates. There were racist comments. He, he grew up, his father left early on, and, and, and the anger that was inside Ben Carson just bubbled over. Well, well there was a time when he, when he nearly seriously harmed another human being, and he said to himself, this has got to stop. In his words, if people could make me angry, they could control me. He went on, why should I give up the power of my life over to that spirit of life? He had demons to conquer, and he knew the power of his faith was greater than any evil on earth. The story we read from Acts chapter 3 takes place at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The people walking into the worship service observed what had happened. They saw this man's feet and ankles made strong. They saw him jump. They saw him walking and praising God. And then that spirit became a little contagious. The people recognized him as being the one who used to sit and beg for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, hear us as we pray. You have come to us in Jesus Christ, who was and is professed to be the great physician. In Christ, broken bodies have been healed. In Christ, broken relationships have been mended. In Christ, the hungry have been fed, the homeless have been sheltered, and the lonely have been befriended. Glory be to you, O God. We marvel at your powerful presence in our midst. Save us, we pray, from arrogance or self-righteousness or pride. Save us, we pray, from the evils within this world that we deplore. Save us, we pray, from thinking or believing or acting like we are better than others. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are mindful this day of many who live with stress, 
with anxiety, with heartache, with too much on their platter. Gracious God, we would be true to your gospel and we would pray that we would be servants of your people. But we are well aware that we often fall short of your calling and many times we are simply unaware of people we should be more hospitable towards. And so we pray, O oh God, let your Holy Spirit minister in ways that we are incapable of. Love your people, we pray. Heal your people, we pray. Bless your people with hope. We trust you, God, to heal your people of diseases that are so terribly destructive. We offer our prayers for teachers and parents seeking to serve children. We offer our prayers for health care workers, for those who are cleaners, for those who are cooks, for those who are social workers and psychologists, for all those who care for our health and well-being. We offer our prayers for leaders in our community who in many ways are hidden on the sidelines and yet make a huge difference in the quality of life we enjoy. We pray for Tao Lin as she recovers, as she continues her recovery at home. We pray for Al Nelson. We pray for Marilyn Dunlap. We pray for those who grieve death and for those who suffer the loneliness and the distance that so many are feeling and experiencing these days. Listen now as together we pray the prayer that was taught us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello everyone, my name is Becky O'Connor. I am wife to Casey O'Connor and mother to Brooke and Caden O'Connor. I grew up in rural Manitowoc on English Lake Road. My family raised elk. I attended Trinity Lutheran School and Manitowoc Lutheran High School. My family was very involved in church growing up. We attended church every Sunday. My dad was on the church council and my parents helped with the offering count. A Christian education is something that is was very important to my parents that my siblings and I had. My parents divorced when I was 18 years old, right after I graduated from high school. My high school years, as I recall them, were an emotional roller coaster. During and after my parents' divorce, I struggled with anxiety and depression. I felt so much hurt. My mom always told me to have faith and keep praying. I hate to admit it, but I felt like praying had become a waste of time. I knew deep down that God and church were important though, and if I wanted to have a future with PC, it had to have God in it. We began attending Grace in August of 2005. We knew that we liked Grace, but we weren't totally convinced until that October. On Saturday, October 8th, 2005, Casey's sister's husband was killed in an ATV accident at the age of 27. When that happened and we started receiving sympathy cards from people at Grace that we didn't even know, we knew that we had found our church home. We were married at Grace on October 21st, 2006. During our married life, we've had our share of the ups and downs along the way. About two years ago, we started seriously looking for our forever home, a little house in the country. I looked through dozens of homes on Zillow and we put in offers on houses and nothing panned out. Finally, I had all about given up. Casey told me that I need to stop trying to force things and just to let things happen. Once I started letting things happen, and not trying to force things. Let me tell you about the God moment that forever changed my life. 
About six years ago, I was asked to train a new employee at work. So in trying to get to know her, I discovered she was from Valders. She also talked about her parents and that her father lived on English Lake Road. It turns out that he had bought the house I grew up in from my dad. She sent me a text message about six months ago stating that her dad had sold that house, but she asked if I had any desire to go through it. Of course I said yes. It had been about 20 years since I was last inside that house and I hadn't even had a chance to say goodbye to it. It was bittersweet going through that house again. Most of it had been remodeled beautifully and my bedroom was the same. Then we walked into the master bedroom and the, the closet doors were open. Inside, I saw a mirror leaning up against the wall with an elk etched on it. It was the mirror that my dad had bought for my mom one Christmas. As we finished walking through the house, unbeknownst to me, my friend had sent a message to her dad asking if I could have that mirror. And he said, yes, tell her to take it. I left my childhood home that evening feeling more at peace than I had ever felt in my life. For all of the elements that had to align in order for that to happen, it was truly God's way of showing me that he is always there even when it doesn't feel like it. You must know that both of my parents are happily remarried and that Casey and I did find our forever home. We moved in just this past January and it so happens that it has the perfect spot for that mirror. You know, when Pastor Kim says, hold fast to that which is good, I do that. I've learned that life can change very quickly, but that if but that if you don't force things, everything will fall into place the way it should, that God is truly always there. With everything going on with the COVID pandemic, again, it may feel as though God is turning his back on us. But if you look around, I feel just the opposite. God is here. Look at all the helpers. I believe this is happening for a reason and that we shouldn't force things, but rather let them play out the way God wants them to. Thank you for your time and God bless you. This is the fifth Sunday that we are offering a virtual worship service for you in your homes. One of the portions of these worship services that has been noticeably absent is the offering. Some of us are electronic givers. Even though I am not a trustee, I thank you for those regularly given gifts. Some of us have sent offering to the church by mail. Again, I thank you for your regard for the church. As we listen to the next piece of music, I simply ask you to be mindful of the ways God has blessed you these past 35 days. How would you complete this sentence? I am grateful for
Well, just before we close again, I'd like to offer my thanks to each of you for the ways you connect to the church during these uh, unusual times that we're living in. Um, the, the leaders of the church are so grateful for your kindness, for your outreach, for your generosity, and just even for those phone calls you're making one to another. Thank you for being the church. Thank you for doing the right thing with each other. And uh, together, together, in prayer and those acts of compassion, we will, we will get through this. Now take these words with you. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone love and serve the lord rejoicing in the power of the holy spirit and now may the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forevermore amen